When a writer begins a story, one of the biggest questions we face is, how should I introduce my main character? I'm Gatsby. The possibilities can feel limitless, but the truth is our choices are and should be limited by the character. Who is this person right now? And who is this person fated to be? A great introduction eschews all other possibilities and focuses on addressing these two questions, posing them, and hinting at their answers. From Wheelhouse Films, this is Page to Screen. My name is Sam, and I'm here to look at three different ways to introduce your character. In the Softy Brothers film, Uncut Gems, our introduction to the main character begins before we've seen or even heard of him. It begins, oddly enough, when two miners unearth a precious gem. Inside this gem, we see tremendous beauty, even magic. But then, all of a sudden, the innards begin to change, and we realize they belong not to a stone, but a human being. A character. That's what we're inside of. We just don't know which part or exactly who yet. Now reaching the right side of the colon. Did that doctor say colon? That looks pretty because clean. that would mean... Wait. W w wait. Oh, oh my. We're inside an asshole. Now we see the asshole's stats. Howard Ratner, 48 male. It's not an especially flattering way to make acquaintances, so why are the writers introducing Howie this way? Well, because this is a man who walks, talks, and, frankly, pulls everything out of his ass. He's a bullshit artist, par excellence. Before we learn Howard's a jeweler or a gambling addict, we see what's on his insides. Beauty, magic, and a whole lot of bullshit. And it's making him sick, possibly killing him. These are the traits which will decide Howie's fate, and the writers have crafted a visual, visceral pun to share them with the audience from the very first moment we meet him. Howard's introduction looked quite literally inside him to tell us about his character. But what if a character projects herself onto the world around her? That's the case of the mysterious central figure in Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard. I had landed myself in the driveway of some big mansion that looked run down and deserted. At the end of the drive was a lovely sight indeed. A great big empty garage, just standing there going to waste. But Wilder doesn't introduce us to the person who lives here right away. First, we meet her car. There was another occupant in that garage. An enormous foreign-built automobile. It must have burned up ten gallons to a mile. It had a 1932 license. I figured that's when the owners had moved out. Then, we meet her house. It was a great big white elephant of a place. The kind crazy movie people built in the crazy twenties. A neglected house gets an unhappy look. This one had it in spades. It was like that old woman in Great Expectations. That Miss Havisham in her rotting wedding dress and her torn veil. Taking it out on the world because she'd been given the go-by. And then, all of a sudden, you there! Why are you so late? Why have you kept me waiting so long? Wilder gives us a glimpse of the character who resides within. Who is this strangely glamorous woman? And why is she living behind these overgrown walls and dark shades? Our desire for answers draws us and Joe deeper. This way! Inside, the mystery only grows. here. I put him on my massage table in front of the fire. He always liked fires and hooking at them with a stick. As Joe approaches, he sees that this woman is performing funeral rites. I've made up my mind we'll bury him in the garden. Any city laws against that? I don't care anyway. I want the coffin to be white, and I want it specially lined with satin. White. Or deep pink. Now that's weird, right? Lady, you got the wrong man. But just when we think we're going to be thrown out without understanding almost anything about this mysterious character, 
thought this was an empty house. It is not. Get out. Okay. Joe, remember something. Wait a minute, haven't I seen you before? I know your face. Get out, or shall I call my servant? You're Norma Desmond. Used to be in silent pictures, used to be big. I am big. It's the pictures that got small. This is the key to the character. Norma Desmond's deepest, innermost fear is irrelevance. Rather than face it, she's frozen herself in the past, built high walls and donned dark sunglasses to keep reality at bay. In short, the character is delusional. Dangerously so. Don't blame me. I, I'm not an executive, just a writer. You are writing words, words, more words. Well, you've made a rope of words and strangled this business. <laughs> but there's a microphone right there to catch the last gurgles. And Technicolor to photograph the red swollen tongue. Remember Norma's words right here. Words about death. Because Wilder is not only introducing her character, he's sneak previewing where her dangerous delusion is fated to end. You wake up the monkey. Get out! Unlike Howard or Norma Desmond, the hubristic defense attorney at the center of primal fear is allowed to introduce himself by being interviewed. Let's say you have a client who you know is guilty. No, don't even start with that. Our justice system doesn't care about that, and neither do I. Every defendant, no matter who he is, regardless of what he's done, has the right to the best defense his attorney can provide, period. On the surface, this guy's ethos sounds righteous. American, even. But what's the first thing we see him doing? So, where were you with the truth? Truth? Washing dirt off his hands. How do you mean? Naomi! Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how many ways there are to mean it. You think there's only one? I can't do this. You're late. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Actually, you're right, you know. There is only one. one that Marty, matters. hold still, please. My version of it. The one I create in the minds of those 12 men and women sitting on a jury. You know, if you want, you could call it something else. The, uh, the illusion of truth. If you want, it's up to you. An illusion. That's all this man's ethos amounts to. In the interview which introduces Martin Vale's character, the writers give the audience not just the basics of his biography. He's a self-promoting lawyer who likes fancy parties. This is a cover story, right? Yeah. yeah. But crucially, his philosophy on the law and by extension life, and in doing so, they've given us enough to intuit that this will be a story in which the protagonist's worldview will be tested and very likely broken. And that's good drama. And in the end, what happens? The vanity and illusion of Martin Vale's philosophy that he has the power to dictate what's true is shattered by a sociopath who all along has been controlling the version of truth well, good Martin Vale believes. You. Martin. Giving him a taste of his own medicine and then pulling the rug out from under him. Had to kill Linda, Mr. Vale. And that whole thing about act like a man? Jesus, I knew exactly what you wanted from me. It was like we were dancing, Marty. Guard. Oh, come on, don't be like that, Marty. We did it, man. We fucking did it. We're a great team, you and me. You think I could have done this without you? And what about Howie? Where does his bullshit artistry get him? He wins the biggest, craziest bet of his life. And then all his crap catches up with him. And Norma Desmond? Her delusion is so great that when Joe tries to shatter it, she kills him. And when the cops come to arrest her, she convinces herself they've come not to arrest her, but to shoot a brand new picture. All right. Cameras. Starring her. Action. Norma Desmond meets her end with a microphone there to catch the last gurgle in Technicolor to photograph the red swollen tongue. Life, which can be strangely merciful, had taken pity on Norma Desmond. The dream she had clung to so desperately had enfolded her. <laughs> So, what's the moral of the story? Character is destiny. When we introduce our characters, we ought to be focused on planting the seeds of that destiny. This might sound like a tall order, but it's an advantage to limit our possibilities and find the best, most personalized introductions 
for each and every one of our characters. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. If you like this breakdown, please subscribe to the rest of our Page to Screen series. Or, if you want to seriously improve your writing, click the link in the description to check out our comprehensive screenwriting retreats, launching this fall on Cape Cod.